We have some incredible sermonettes. Will be preached. The title that's inspired these sermonettes is Blessed Rather Are Those Who Hear the Word of God and Obey It out of Luke chapter 11, verse 28, imitating Jesus' ministry. Our first preachers here for the sermonettes from the mighty Fresno Church, I give you Eric and Ariel Tramp. Well, good morning, Thrive Leaders. How we doing? My name is Eric. This is my splendiferous wife, Ariel. We get to serve the mighty Fresno Church. And we've been given the title, Starting Out Front, again. Such a fitting topic, I think, for Ariel and I, since we've had to flex this muscle, as over the past three years, we will have planted three different groups. Uh, in 2020, we got the chance to plant the Contra Costa region. Uh, and then in 2022, the Fresno Church. And then this year, the Anchorage, Alaska Church. You know, looking at plantings uh, in the Bible, one cannot miss the life of Paul. Uh, Paul was commissioned there to be a church planter in Acts 13 in Antioch. And that's where he began to immediately uh, start his career. Over the 13 years, he embarked on three missionary journeys, traveling over 7,000 miles, and planted at least 14 churches. Some commentators say up to 20 churches. In his first missionary journey alone, between 48 AD and 50 AD, he planted Iconium, Lystra, Derby, so three churches in three years. In his second missionary journey, between 51 and 53 AD, he planted uh, Cilicia, Lyconia, Galatia, Troas, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. That's crazy. But this is just what our brother Paul did. Thessalonica, Acts 17, verse 2. It was his custom. Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. In Berea, Acts 17, 10. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. In Athens, Acts 17, verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue. Corinth, 18, verse 4. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue. In Ephesus, chapter 18, verse 19. They arrived in Ephesus. There Paul left Priscilla and Aquila, and he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when the Jews wouldn't have any more of it, he said, forget you guys, I'm going to campus. And in Acts 18, verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Between Acts 17 and 18, Paul planted nine churches. Nine churches in just three years. If you do the math, on average, he spent only six months in each of these churches. Think about that. Staying in your church, staying in your region, staying in your ministry, staying in your Bible talk, building it up for six months and then going someplace completely different. You know, the principle of starting out front is not a new concept for some of us. And many of us received some excellent teaching yesterday by Dr. Jason Dimitri on its core concepts. But its practice is a little harder than you might think. You know, many of you are out front. You're leading Bible talk. You're doing Seeking God studies. You're doing the work along with many of your fellow leaders, your fellow disciples. And again, this might not seem like a big deal, but we're not talking about starting out front. We're talking about starting out front again. I know for me, as a 45-year-old, bald, white guy with uh, gray uh, in his beard, the last thing that I, I, like my sinful nature wants to do is go on campus where everybody there could be my kid. You know what I mean? And the old guys on campus are weird. You know what I'm saying? They need Jesus too, okay? But we began living out this principle, again, in Contra Costa, Fresno, uh, while working full-time, we went full-time in the ministry in April of last year. And we get to do it again when we go to Anchorage, Alaska. So what does this require of you and me? Well, we're all familiar with 1 Samuel 18, 16, but all Israel and Judah loved David because they led him in their campaigns. 
But I want to pass it off to Ariel because there was an interesting little insight that she had that I want her to be able to share with you all, especially the sisters, uh, as we were studying for this topic. Amen. Hello, leaders of God's incredible movement. Um, so yeah, it's it's amazing this idea of starting out front again. And to um, to Eric's point, it can be really really challenging to want to start out front again. We're like, oh, I kind of raised up somebody. They can kind of do seeking God. They can kind of do words. So I'll just sit back and kick it till they get to kingdom. Oh. That may be some of us. That's been me. Oh man. Okay. So so I get it. I'm just getting open here. Okay. Um, but we can actually also be really excited about this notion of David leading his campaigns as well, right? Because um, our view, it's our view of leading people into into battle is kind of exciting, right? If you think about it, it's like really exciting to be like, yeah, I get to lead somebody into battle. This is great. But that's because we have Hollywood's version of leading people into battle. Um, so when I think of leading people into battle, I think of Wonder Woman. Come on, sisters. I don't know if sisters you can relate, but this is one of my favorites. And um, so I'm a sister who I'm I'm that I'm that person who I get teary eyed and I get like I and I cry in movies, but but movies like uh, MJ's Last Dance, okay, Michael Jordan, you're like so the brothers are like I know that movie, um, or Remember the Titans, come on, or Rudy. Right, underdog stories, but but I also get really, really teary-eyed when I see that underdog Hallmark movie romance finally come together too. Okay, so so I can be that I can be that person, but my favorite of all time really is Wonder Woman, right? And so Wonder Woman, it quite literally gives me the chills. And my favorite scene of all time is when she's in the trenches. Right? How many of you guys have seen that movie? She's in the trenches and like nobody's doing anything and they're like all hiding. And she's like, what the what? And then she, she crawls up out of the trenches and she just charges the enemy, right? And she's just like bearing down and she's got her shield and she's taking fire and it's amazing and it's like, wow! You know, but, but that's Hollywood's version, <laughs> okay? That's Hollywood's version, but it's inspiring us, and it, it inspired her people to follow her. And when we're when we start out front, it actually inspires the women that we lead. Come on. And we're gonna take some hits, right? But we're inspired because of her courage, her tenacity. Um, but but we don't always see the parts where we have to take hits, Come on, yeah. right? Come on. Come on. And we 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 see the glory, we see the victory. But sadly, what we've done sometimes is, and Hollywood has equipped us with this, um, we've equated leadership and leading campaigns with being a hero. And that's why our zeal can so quickly die after a conference, mm. right? But, but what happens when you become the one who gets hit by an unexpected arrow or cut by the sword and it just deeply, deeply wounds you? What happens in the middle of the campaign, in the middle of battle, when no one can come to your aid? Because they're out battling too. Mm. Or maybe they just didn't show up and didn't communicate. Come on wow. Right? But this is what it means to lead a campaign, yeah. okay? This is what it means. The reality is that a campaign, however, is not one week. Right. It's not two weeks oh, yeah. at the beginning of the semester. David's campaigns didn't last a week. Oh. They lasted until the job was done. No matter what size the army, our job is not done until either the world is won or God takes us home. Yep, yep. And this is who David was. But more importantly, sisters, this is who David became. And this is who we must become too. Turn over to Psalm 132. You're going to want to grab a highlighter. This blew my mind. So Psalm 132, verse 1 says, Lord, remember David and all his self-denial. Mm -hmm. He swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will not allow sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. This brings me great joy, sisters. 
It also begs the question, could you say this to God? Remember my self-denial? And what would he remember of your self-denial? Mm. David had to deny himself. And so you're not alone, but David was able to lead one campaign after another and fight one battle after another because he learned to deny himself at greater and greater levels. We must love the battle more than the baptisms. We must love the battle. God will bring the fruit. The fruit is God's. The baptisms are the fruit. But will your work and will your love for the battle and all the arrows produce what is necessary for God to bring the fruit? Come on. Amen. David did this because he understood that to start out front again and again, much like Paul, was not a season in his life. But it was the very call of God every single day. Come on. So sisters, get up early while it's still dark. Amen. And not because your roommates got up and woke you up. Plan to spend your time with your Lord. Be on campus. Be on campus ready to go on fire for God by 10 o'clock. Why 10 o'clock? Well, some of you might have class at 8. That's awesome. But what about those of us who don't have class until later? What about those of us who are leading churches or leading regions or all these kinds of things or, or we're working? Find a way. Find a way. Because the battle is ours because the battle is our God's. Mm, come on. Be humble, sisters. Just as a reminder, and I have to always be reminded of this, that you don't lead your Bible talk and you don't lead that ministry. That brother does. So start out front in your humility, Come on. in your willing to follow his direction. Make his leadership a joy and watch the fruit come because of your unity. Come on. So sisters, I love you so much, but the battle is ours. The fruit is ours. Start out front and love the battle. Amen. You know, David swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty God of Jacob. David was in search of a resting place, and each and every one of us is the resting place of God, the temple within us. And our job is to go and not give any rest to ourselves until God finds rest in the men and the women that we are going to see on our campuses, in our workplaces, all over the world. Because we are chosen, his elect and his special possession, there's no amount of self-denial. That is too much for us to see the world won in our day. And that is why each and every one of us, including the Shrams, are fired up to start out front again. We love you all very much. To God be the glory. Well, uh, good morning. It is great to be back here in San Francisco again. And uh, my wife and I uh, have been given the charge to push to be radical. And of course, uh, my name is Kyle Bartholomew, and this is my beautiful wife, Janine. But uh, turn your Bibles, if you can, to Luke chapter 9. And uh, we're going to look and see how Jesus trained his guides. The Bible says in verse 1, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt, whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. You know, it's kind of amazing. Jesus trains his guys, and the direction he gives them is quite profound. He goes, I want you to go, but take nothing. If you got a wallet, leave it home. Don't even take an extra shirt, so just take what you're wearing. Take no staff, no stick. Take nothing to prepare, and then, by the way, where you go, don't worry about staying anywhere. 
There is nowhere that has been organized for you to stay at. But don't worry about it. Just go and preach, and someone's going to invite you to stay with them. So if you don't preach, you have nowhere to stay. So this is how he trains his initial guys. Look over in Luke chapter 10. So that was the 12. Here, he's going to train 72 others. And certainly you would train the second tier guys, not necessarily, or uh, I, I would say, not as hard as the first group of guys. Because that's the nice thing to do. But in Luke 10 and verse 1, the Bible says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he's about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go! I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If someone promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter town or are welcome to eat what is offered to you, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed or go into the streets and say, even the dust on your town we wipe from our feet as a warning against you. Yet be sure this the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day than Sodom than for that town. So here he trains the second tier guys the same exact way as the first tier. And in addition, he adds, hey, by the way, if you go and you preach and they don't like it and they persecute you, don't worry about it. Just shake the dust off of your feet as a testimony against them and then keep on going. You know, when I uh, first read this passage and, of course, had gotten into the ministry and saw that when we sent out mission teams, very often we sent out at least 10, sometimes even 20, with a purse and with supplies, I actually was quite conflicted. I go, maybe we should do it more like the Bible. And then I sort of imagined what that would look like. Then I found the passage in Luke 22. Go there if you can. This, this should encourage your faith a little bit. The Bible says in Luke 22, and we'll pick it up in verse 35, so he's having them reflect back on the time in which he trained them. So then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it. If you have a bag, and if you do not have, don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. You know, kind of amazing, he reflects back, and Jesus says, when I sent you out with nothing, was there anything that you lacked? They go, wow, it's funny you asked that. We thought there would be a lack, but when you sent us out, there was none. Here we find that Jesus intentionally made it difficult for them during training. So when they actually went into the field, they would find it even to be easier than their training was. And it was to give them faith that even if God called them to go somewhere with no resource, that God would still supply what was necessary. I love at the very end where one brother goes, hey, I've got, I've got two swords. In every church, there's always a few guys that are carrying around pocket knives. And it is funny, whenever there is a need for a pocket knife, which is pretty much never, they will run from the very corners of the church to offer it up. And uh, if you're here today, you know who I'm talking to. Uh, with that in mind, we need to push our people to be radical. I'm going to have my wife share a few things. Well, good morning, family. It is so great to see many of you again. And I'm so grateful to be able to speak about 
push to radical. You know, according to Google, radical is a change of action that is very different from usual and traditional. And it's the opposite of superficial. And I thought that was an amazing definition. In that, as disciples, we don't want to be usual or superficial, right? You know, growing up in the Philippines, I was always taught that I needed to be polite and never say anything that would be hurtful to another person, even though if it's the truth. And this led me to grow up thinking that sentimentality was good, when in fact it is very deadly. That is why we must push people to be radical. After all, we serve a radical God who sent his son to die for us in a radical way, which is the only reason why we are here today. You know, for the past few days, I had a chance to reflect on why pushing people to be radical is difficult for me and us as leaders in general. And I came up with a couple of reasons that I hope will help you this morning. First, I, is I worry that by pushing my people, I will hurt them. Maybe you can relate to this feeling, and as I think it is especially common for the women. However, it is quite strange when you think about it. Why do we feel afraid to hurt people by pushing them to do what the Bible clearly tells them to do? In addition, we are pushing them to be better and be more skilled at what they're already commanded to do. And I don't know why that would hurt anybody, but for some reason, it feels that way. And I think we need to understand that, it is, that this is just a feeling. And our feelings are not necessarily rational or true. The truth is, the way we hurt people is by not pushing them to be radical. In the same way, we hurt people when we're studying with them and we don't call them to repent. Yeah. We hurt people that we disciple when we don't push them to radical change. Yeah. And when I think about my life and what I have been successful at, mainly in academics and Taekwondo, I had some very tough coaches and some very strict mentors. They didn't care if I was tired, if I'm feeling a little sick or I'm uncomfortable. They pushed me because they wanted me to, to do the most I was capable of doing. And it is sad to think that we can view the ministry of Jesus, in which the goal is to save souls, as less of a reason to push people than with academics and sports. The fact is, our job is the most, most important that exists. And we only hurt the people we disciple when we don't push them to be radical. The second most common feeling is that I can experience is the fear of conflict. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting that most of us, including myself, can view conflict as a negative thing. Mm. The Bible does teach that we shouldn't enjoy conflict, mm. which is clear as you study out the book of Proverbs. But conflict is a necessary part of our life. Yeah. Yeah. As an example, any marriage that's, that does not engage in conflict will never last. Yeah. When we are hurt, upset, or conflicted about our relationship with our spouse, the only way to fix it is to have conflict. Yeah. And I'm not suggesting we have a sinful conflict, but constructive conflict. Yeah. And the reason why I and many of us are afraid of conflict is that we are not very good at it. We are nervous, afraid, and overcompensate being harsh. And the problem is, if you have someone in your ministry that is not having a great quiet time, not active in sharing their faith, and is not contributing to the body of Christ, you will never be able to help them without constructive conflict. In fact, we have a name for constructive conflict, and it is called discipling. <laughs> that conflict is not something I should fear, but rather something I need to become better at. And the only way to improve is by engaging in it and pushing people to be radical. And lastly, the most damaging is we don't push people to be radical because we don't believe in them. You know, we need to have a vision for everyone to serve God in their greatest capacity in whatever gift God has given them. Yeah. And that being said, radical is for everyone. Yeah. So ladies, let's make a decision to fully believe in our people, 
not only to those people who's easy to push, but also those people who is hard to push. Let's not go on our feelings because it's not always rational or true. Let's not be scared of having conflict, but be better at it. And let's push our people to be radical. Thank you for letting me share. With that being said, push your people to be radical. Thank you. My name is Jacob, and this is my super fragilistic, expialidocious wife, Courtney Venus. And we've been given the topic, Preach Into Existence. I gotta tell you what I see in this room this morning. I see an army of mighty, powerful preachers. Preachers of God's Word. I mean, that is what we are here fighting and straining to raise on up. Let me tell you what, why I see that is because that's the very thing that God sees right before you. I want us to look at an incredible scripture right here in Ezekiel 37 that hits this point. I love preaching God's word. There's nothing cooler than that, than bringing God's word to life and impacting and seeing it God work in people's lives. Right here in Ezekiel 37, this is a cranking scripture. It says, the hand of the Lord was upon me. Maybe that's how you felt in 2023. He brought me out by the Spirit, and the Lord set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones, and he led me back and forth among them. I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, oh, sovereign Lord, uh, you alone know. And then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I'll make breath enter you and you will come to life. I'll attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds of breath and breathe into the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. That's the power of preaching the word into existence. This is what we do day in and day out. Yeah. I mean, this is incredible. And let me tell you what, we gotta be reminded because God is gonna put us in situations like this where we are in a valley. This is what he's gonna do. Put us into dry situations. That's just what a preacher's gotta go do. But a preacher sees if I preach God's word, this is what's gonna happen. Life is gonna come up and an army is gonna be raised for the Lord. And every one of us, is right here, is asked that same question that God asks right here. Son of man, can these bones live? Right. Honestly, this is just a question of faith. Right. And I love Ezekiel right here. He just kind of plays it cool. Like, oh, it's just yeah. kind of the safe answer. That, well, you will lower, you will alone know. Yeah. But I think God was just checking out his, his faith right there. Yeah. What do you see, Ezekiel? Do you see what I see? Yeah. A vast army. Yeah. Go preach to it. Right. That's the solution. That's always the solution when the church or a ministry or a Bible talk is in a valley. When a situation might be dry, you preach the God's word over and over and over again until that situation is resurrected. We preach believing. That's how we preach. You tell the people who they are. 
that was something I had to learn. I mean, I was a young preacher right there, and, you know, I would put together those lessons, and uh, I'd just be asking, like, a ton of questions. You know, do you share your faith? Do you have quiet times? Are you praying? Are you sold out? And it's like beating the congregation. The congregation is just, no one's resurrecting. They're dying again over and over and over again. But you tell the people who they are, you're a mighty warrior. You're faithful. You're a conqueror. You believe anything is possible. And that's how they leave. You tell them that until they believe it. That's what we do. That's what God saw. He saw a vast army, and Ezekiel preached that puppy into existence. This is what we see in our Bible time. That's right, bro. This is what God wants you to see going into 2024, because maybe how you saw it, like, man, this is a valley right here. These are dry bones. But you know what? You see with eyes of faith. My Bible talk is awesome. They're an army. My region is awesome. This is an incredible army. My church is awesome. This is an incredible army for the Lord. And we're going to do great things this year. Let me tell you what. Your profession is your possession. You name it and claim it. You preach it and you bet your bottom dollar you're going to reap it. Oh, I had it over more. to preach on this principle of Jesus' ministry to preach it into existence. And this is all Jesus did everywhere he went. He was just telling people who they were, not who they thought they were, but who he knew they were. And, you know, the reality is, though, whatever your situation is, we have faith, right? We never complain about our people. We never complain about those we disciple. We don't complain about our ministries, our Bible talks, our households. But we do see that sometimes there is areas that are dry that are dead, that might need a little breath of life, right? And so what are those areas in your disciple's life, in your own life, in your Bible talk, in your church, your region, that needs some life, some breath of God? And, you know, there's, there's a spirit that might need to come into you or your group, your church. And that's just, that's just being, a, you know, being able to see things the way that they are. Those are the things that we preach at. As women, we sit on those things. Right? And so, is everyone a worker? If it's not a culture of everyone being a worker, that's what you preach on, and it will happen. Are there limits? Do you see limits in the women's ability to die to themselves, as we heard Hugo preach about today so eloquently? That's what you preach on. You preach it into existence, a no-limits culture. Are people making leaders? Right? Are they students of Jesus' ministry? Are they getting better? Maybe you see that there's a dry area of people aren't really family. That's what you preach on. You preach it until you see it come to fruition. Right? And I think, you know, for us recently, we learned that when a sister came to SAC, that people didn't really come and greet her. That she didn't feel like she was, like, super welcomed. And that is what we're going to preach on in Sacramento. That people feel loved, they feel honored, they feel respected. And that is what we are going to get. So whatever you see might be dry, might be a little a little crusty, a little dusty. Preach at it. Preach it into existence. And I think that, you know, it was so incredible when we planted the church in Sacramento because we started with nothing. We, we would have Devo, and it was the same 13, 14 faces in our living room. But you preach until it comes to fruition. And I, when I look at the Sacramento church now after, after coming back after a few years, I am so blown away by the disciples, by the sisters' hearts that I see in the church. And it only comes from preaching something into existence. I love you guys. I think that's a great challenge. What you want to see, God is calling you to go back and preach that into existence. I love Mark 9, verse 29, where the Bible says, according to your faith, it will be done. And that's how we're leaving right here. And so God wants us to go back in our ministries, our respective regions, our churches, and we don't see headstones. We see living stones. We don't see graves. We see all that can be saved. We don't see death. We see life coming from God's breath, His mighty word. Let's go back and preach it into existence. I love you. To God be the glory. All right. Good afternoon, church. How's everybody doing? 
guys, let's give it for the Biases. And let's give it for the Chavises for putting together this incredible workshop. And uh, we bring you greetings from Los Angeles, California. And Sarah and I are excited to talk to you about a fountain of leadership. And we know that a mountain in the Bible what? the kingdom. So the title of our charge for you today is No Fountain, No Mountain. And I stole that from Ole. Now, it's pretty cool because a fountain in itself actually is quite symbolic, and it's why they're all over the world. I mean, you can go to great cities all over the world, San Francisco, and there are famous fountains. And the reason why we have fountains, they're supposed to symbolize eternity because the water, it just keeps going up and down and around and around, and it'll just keep going, and it's never going to stop. In the same way, eternity just keeps going, and it's never going to stop. But it's also to really symbolize sustainability. You never need to put more water into the fountain. And what's pretty amazing, that if you look at all the water on the earth, it is a fountain. It talks about this in Isaiah 55. It says all the water, it comes down from the heavens, and then it comes up again, and it goes around and around and around and around. So if we want to build the mountain, the kingdom, we need to have a fountain of leadership. If we want to get it into eternity and we want to have sustainability, it's going to take us having a fountain of leadership. Now to tell us all on how to do it, I hand it over to my incredible wife. Hi, guys. Well, Gandhi said a sign of a good leader is not how many followers you have, but how many leaders you create. Pretty cool, right? I like Gandhi. But Jesus, we know, is way cooler. Okay. And he got this on straight. I think that Gandhi got this from Jesus, actually, because it reminds me of the scripture in Acts chapter 1, verse 12. You guys know the scripture, but it says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath they walked from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary. Pretty awesome. The mother of Jesus and with his brothers. So, what's really cool here is that Jesus... Um, when he died, I mean, yeah, he only had 120 followers, but they weren't just regular disciples, okay? These people were world-beating leaders that were ready to go preach the world, to evangelize the entire known world at that time, and they actually did. They did preach things into existence, like we just heard. Pretty incredible. And Jesus, while he was on earth, yes, he was seeking and saving the lost. He was saving people. He was making disciples. He taught people how to do that. But his biggest focus was making leaders and raising up that fountain of leadership so that when he was gone, this 120 could do far greater things than him. Isn't that incredible? And so what's on my heart today is I think that there is a lot of great disciples in this room, but there may not be a lot of great leaders yet. Okay, And part of being a great leader is that you've got to get your ministry and your disciples to do what you're doing. I think the whole point of this talk is you guys have heard these things a million times. But are you doing it? Maybe this is the year that you actually have the faith to do it. Where you're like, no, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And you've got to get people to do the work. Everyone in your Bible talk doing the work. And so I just have two things I want to encourage you with this afternoon. And I do think if you implement them, you will have a fountain of leadership. And again, you've heard this. But what I want you guys to focus on is, are you doing it? And if not, why? One, you got to sync up everyone's schedule in your Bible talk. <laughs> you got to do it. This is the key to really growing and building that effective fountain of leadership. And this is not just for the campus. This is for the singles and the marrieds and the teens, okay? But yes, particularly the campus ministry, I think this is important. And the challenge is that sometimes you see the interns or the ministry leaders doing all the work and they're there because everyone's in, in classes and so they can't be there. And so what you gotta do is 
is you gotta help people free up their schedule so they can be there on time and they can be there together. So there's always, you know, three to six disciples sharing their faith and in Bible studies together, okay? That's very important. And I think that um, to make this happen, you gotta sit down and you gotta talk about it. And sometimes that's an awkward conversation to have and you gotta call people to change their jobs at times. And maybe you're like, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. But did you do it? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. People keep talking to me about this. But did you call your people to do it? Why not? If you want to see fruit, people have to do this. You've got to get that early coffee house job. I was just talking to a sister in LA, and she's like, I couldn't find a coffee house job, so we're going to have McDonald's early. I get off by 11. I was like, wow, McDonald's, okay. There's also nannying jobs. Our daughter has a nannying job, and she puts and she goes to school full time as a nurse, and so she puts in her very limited hours, and she, they, she finds a job nannying. And so I think we've got to go after that this year. But um, it's not just the campus, it's the marrieds. The last Mingles Bible talk that Jason and I led was in 2013 in Long Beach. And that was such a cool Bible talk. And looking back, I'm like, yeah, we, we did. We, we, we got everyone's schedules together to build a synergy. And they were married and single. That was our Bible talk. We always went sharing together. And it was so fruitful. There was a fountain of leadership. Um, that was when... Cassidy, Anthony and Cassidy almost were in that Bible talk, and now they lead the Paris church. Also, that was when Rebecca Gray, now Gray, was in our Bible talk, and now she leads the Edinburgh Scotland church with her husband, Colby. Pretty awesome. So it is important to do this. Skip that, skip that. I'm running out of time. Number two, we got we to gotta help our disciples to answer the call of leadership. And maybe you need to answer the call of leadership. Hey. How many times have you come to one of these things and you're like, totally believe that, totally, yes. And you're like, woo, the zeal. But, but you're like, I haven't really bought into the call. It's good for that person and for that sister, but yeah, it's not for, uh, 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 uh. Okay, but now is the time, guys. And we got to help our people buy into that. And it's going to take tough talks to help them surrender their lives to do God's plan for their lives. And it, sometimes it's going to take tears. And it's going to take fasting and, and praying to align your dreams with God's dream. Because for some of you, maybe you know you need to lead. You know you need to answer that call and to train for the ministry. But if you're honest, you don't want the pressure. You don't want the responsibility. Too many people, people are saying, right? Okay. That's what it is. Maybe you're insecure and you just need to get over yourself. Are you going to fail? Totally. Who cares? Do you love God more than yourself? Maybe there's just something like a lack of forgiveness. I've talked to too many disciples that are just living in unrepentant sin. A lack of forgiveness. Or, or maybe there's just a deep purity issue in your life. Or bitterness. I don't know what it is, but I want to encourage you guys to repent and align your dreams with God's dreams. Here's the thing. We're here with you. We understand. It's not like I answered the call one time. I had to answer the call last year. I had to go to L.A. Fernando and Jackie had to answer the call. That wasn't a fun conversation. They loved where they were at. It wasn't a fun conversation for us. We loved being in San Francisco, okay? We had to answer the call. We had to align our dream with God's dream. And um, when you do that, that's the only time you're really going to be happy. Right. And I just, please just write that down. We think that we are in control of our lives and we know how to make ourselves happy. You don't. Yeah. <laughs> and you're only going to be happy when you let go and you let God lead you where he wants you to go. Skip that, skip that. Just remember that. Love you guys. Shared a lot on our heart today. I appreciate my wife. My wife is a hardline lady. Amen. I hope you're convicted. Uh, turn with me over. I do want to share a scripture with you as we close out uh, this church builder session, this staff session. Turn me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to pick it up in verse 21. It says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special modesty. 
and the parts that are unpresentable be treated with special modesty, while the presentable parts need no special treatments. You know, this is a, a wonderful passage of scripture, but if you really think about it lived out, it's quite challenging. You know, I just got to ask you, would you rather be a bicep or a pinky? Which one would you choose on that one? Anybody want to be the pinky? Raise your hand. All right. All right. You're not playing into... Eric did that just to mess up my lesson. I know he does not want to be a pinky. Would you rather be the tricep or the armpit? You want to be, you ever seen like one of those tricep posing? Would you rather be a tricep or armpit? Anybody want to be the armpit? No, you don't. I know you don't want to be that. How about the uh, six pack or love handle? Which one? Nobody wants to be the love handle, right? All right, so you all want to be muscle. You know what's going to happen? God's going to treat you as such. And here's the thing I've said for many years, one of the most difficult things you could do in God's movement is to do well. Because when you do well here, and you all said you want to be it, you're going to get treated with, with no special modesty. In fact, you're instead going to be worked out until at times you feel exhausted. But this is what's going to happen to the San Francisco church. Because like it or not, you are a muscle. And this is what's going to happen to the L.A. church. Because like it or not, we're, we are a muscle. And we're going to be asked to do a lot of things. We're going to be asked to send people. We're going to be asked to send finances. We're going to ask to be, bring people in and heal them. We're going to be asked to do a lot of things that other groups just are not in the position to do. And all that's going to come at a cost. It's all going to come at really the detriment at times, even to the church here locally. And the only that way that we're going to be able to combat that and see this church go to greater heights is that if we build a fountain of leadership. There's no way that we're going to be able to do what God wants us to do if you don't go out this year and find two or three people, not just like yourself, better than yourself. Better than yourself. See, Christianity is supposed to be about being selfless. We're looking for people who could do more than we could do. You know, maybe you can't lead portion of the world, but you could find somebody who can. Maybe you're going to baptize the next Kwaku who can lead a country. Or you're going to baptize the next Ole who can lead a super region. Or you're going to restore somebody like Anthony who could go and lead a church in Paris in a geographic sector in Europe. Maybe that's what you can do. And if you go and do it this year, we are going to build a fountain of leadership. But I'm here to tell you, if we build no fountain, there will be no mountain. And to God be all the glory. <laughs>